Hello and welcome to part two of six, as we said, of the Dogger Bank Long Patrol series. Parts one to five will be individual videos about the battles. Part six will be answering questions which come up underneath them before I record it. So that's why parts five and six will be put up on Wednesday because, well, part six will be recorded on Wednesday. I, that's the 17th of February, 2021. Let's see, we're up to the Battle of 1781. Yay! And finally, really the most interesting in so many ways of the groups enters the fray because the British are going to be involved in four out of five of the battles we're covering. And they could their percentage only goes up higher the more you widen out the area of including into this contest. This is the fourth Anglo-Dutch War. Yes, there have been three prior to, prior to this. The British and the Dutch, for nations which often get along, manage to spend a lot of time fighting each other. Basically, I'm I'm going to go for it's the it's the fraternal thing. You know, we always fight most with those we're closest to. And it's the fifth of August, 1781. And it's the British squadron versus the Dutch squadron, and Britain wins on points. It's always fun when Britain wins on points. It's kind of like the Battle of Jutland all over again. Another one we could stick in this series if we wanted to. Now, because we're in the 1700s, this has all changed. We're now at the first rates. They're 100 plus guns. Emphasis on the plus. Second rates, 84 to 90 guns, 98 guns. So if you are two guns short, that's one less, extra, less gun on each broadside, you are a second rate rather than a first rate. Third rate, 64 to 80 guns. You'll often find a measure in the 72-74s as standard because that's found to be a good way like the one illustrated, to lay out the guns and provide a very balanced ship. Fourth rate, um, ship of the line, if more 60 or more guns, usually still, but a frigate if less than 60 guns, and basically a heavy frigate. Your enforcer frigate, if you need one. Fifth rate, your core frigate fleet, and the sixth rate are your frigate sloops and brigs. You do sometimes have other ships below that, referred to as a sloop or a brig, uh, depending on the scenario. But, yep, that's your first to six rates. There are also ships down below, which can be called swans. If you want to go sailing in a swan, you can, but I've heard it's highly aggressive and tends to be painted white. So, the fleets involved. Well, this is going to be a complicated one. So, the Royal Navy. 446 guns in total for the ships and the line, providing a cumulative broadside of 223 guns. However, this outnumbers the 412 guns in total for ships in the line, providing a cumulative total of 206 of the Dutch, who are escorting convoy, of course, both sides are sort of escorting convoys home. One's coming back from America, the other one's coming from the Dutch West East Indies, I think, as well. So also from the same time, they managed to meet up in the North Sea. Fun times. Anyway. The British have five ships of the line. Princess Amelia. 80 guns. Third rate. HMS Fortitude. 74 guns. Third rate. And the flagship of Admiral Hyde Parker, 5th Baronet, and a very nice gentleman. Um, flag Captain, Captain George Robinson. HMS Berwick, 74 guns, 3rd rate, Captain John Ferguson. Beneficent, 64 guns, a 4th rate, Captain Richard Braithwaite. Buffalo, 60 guns, 4th rate, Captain William Truscott. And then he has 6 frigates, 240 guns in total. Preston. 50 guns, 4th rate, and under Captain Alexander Graham joins the ships of the line to balance the line, and Dolphin, HMS Dolphin, 44 guns, 5th rate. Captain William Blair joins the ship's line to balance the line. So, you have two of the sort of 
fourth rates, oh, well, one of the fourth rates, one of the fifth rates, have moved up to join the line. So they can balance off against Admiral General uh, 74 Guns Third Rate under Jan Hendrik van Kinberg, the Admiral de Reuter 68 Guns Third Rate under Staring Zultzman's flagship, uh, under Commander Captain Staring and Zultzman's flagship, Admiral, uh, the Commander of the Dutch, Holland uh, 68 Guns Third Rate, Captain Badedel, the sinks after the battle, so it's one of the reasons why the British win on points. Erfrins, 54 guns, 4 freight, under Commander Brack. Batvavia, 54 guns, 4 freight, under the Commander Betnik. Admiral Piet Heen, 54 guns, under the gun, uh, 4 freight, under the Commander Van Bram. And. The 7 frigates for a total of 228 guns. And guess what? Argo, 40 guns, under the Commander Starring, joins the ship's line to balance out the battle. So they both have 7 ships in the line. Kind of an interesting thing in that at every single line, uh, lay, uh, way up the line, barring for Admiral Piet Hin versus Peston, the British ships have more guns than their counterpart. Not a massive amount, but enough that it counts. Let's be honest, 17 more guns in a broadside is not going to bear that much. It's not even... Well, you know... 17 more guns equates to a fifth rate more, I suppose, a 34-gun fifth rate. So it's basically the equivalent of having an extra fifth rate in the line uh, for the um, Dutch, but... No. Interesting in this battle is that there's Latonia, uh, Latona, one of the frigates of the British HMS Latona, under the command of Captain Hyde Parker, the sixth Baronet Hyde Parker, and the Hyde Parker who would be Nelson's commander at Copenhagen. Notice there is a link in both these battles back to, the Den uh, to Denmark. In the first battle, we talked about 1696, they escaped to Denmark. In this battle, we're talking about uh, there's the future commander of the operation which sees the destruction of Copenhagen. It's fun. And these are strong fleets, but they're quite even fleets. It very much is an even contest. Yes, the British have 12 ships, and the Dutch have 13 ships, but the British, as said, The British overall have, let's see, uh, 254 plus 352 equals 606 guns in total. And oh, the Dutch have 600 guns in total. So it's a very, very even force. It's it, You couldn't get a more even fleet mix if you tried. It, it's pretty much the British and the Dutch turning up going, oh, we've got brought exactly the same things to the party. Yes, if they got the entire fleets lined up against each, next to each other, A, poor HMS Surprise with her seven guns would have been probably facing off against Dolphin and Ajax with, well, Surprise has 14 guns, that's a broadside of seven, um, with Dolphin and Ajax each having 12 and 10 gun broadside each, so she'd have been seven versus 22. It's probably good it wasn't a whole fleet ship of line action. Um, again, this is not unusual. You can have a line engagement where they're blasting away each other and then it turns into a general melee action and that's when ships dive in amongst each other and sometimes the frigates dive in and add their fire to the mix. It, one of the things you have to get away from quite early on in history is there are lots of manuals which will be very firm about guidelines, about the rules of how combat should be done, how they should stick to the line, stick to the line. 
But the reality of history is that commanders often do deviate from the expected orders. They often have to. They have a reason for it. They have a complication. They have all sorts of issues which can come up, which mean they are going to deviate from those rules. Here's the first thing about the Age of Sail battles, which I want to get. I want to quickly mention this one. Just because all the paintings have them formed up in a line, and just because the history they form up in a line, and that's how they do their engagement, because that allows them to bring the most guns to bear, doesn't mean they spend the whole time in battle. Believe it or not, you can't carry out a boarding action if you're all grouped up in a line. At a certain point, one of the lines hopefully starts to break under weight of fire, or though there's a sailing miscalculation, or the wind blows, or something happens which allows you to either cross the other's T, in which case you're able to blast them all down, or they break up. At that point, your line breaks up as you individually go after your targets and chase in. That's when you have the boarding actions. That's when you have the fights that we understand, that we sort of see pictured in the movies. And that's before we get on to individual ship actions or a couple of ships versus a single ship, which happen a lot more frequently than the big battles. And the big battles happen, happen frequently enough compared to the modern times. So it really is a far richer, more complex and nuanced scenario than a fixed one and the other technique. Here are the commanders. Admiral Sir Hyde Parker, 5th Baronet. And he's a pretty darn cool admiral. He's been out fighting in America, beating up various people and doing quite well in America. He is a competent commander. And a Rear Admiral Johann Zutman, also a competent commander. Sir Hyde Parker had fought in the Seven Years' War and the American War of Independence and had quite a naval career. He captured a Spanish galleon worth more than £600,000. Um, he still has descendants living in Melford Hall. He'd entered the Royal Navy and managed to make a lieutenant at, uh, at the age of 24. Entering the Royal Navy at 24, uh, after being born in 1714, he may have made a lieutenant in 1744 and was a post-captain by 1748. That's quite an accelerated career. If you consider in 1748, he was 34 years old. Let me just do the maths again. Yeah, 34 years old. Um, he'd been 30 when he'd made lieutenant. And he had started his career at sea in the merchant service. He was an experienced merchant sailor. So in many ways, he's rather like Jean Bart, who we talked about earlier. But he did come from noble blood. After all, he is the fifth baronet. Not the first, the fifth. Been Rear Admiral in North American waters and second in command. Um, then he was given command of Leeward Island stations and eventually he sails home. After being, He's vice admiral at this point for this battle. And fights a Dutch force which is actually better equipped And the reason it's considered better equipped is because his ships have come are off a very long voyage, and the Dutch ones are going out. I think that was the pl uh, that was the thing. There's a sort of debate as to all this. Um, Johan Zoutman.
Well, he was another experienced naval officer. He'd served. Uh, he was served in the, uh, in the in Dutch forces for a long time, and he's about ten years younger. But again, by no means an inexperienced officer. So you have two very experienced officers and you have a broadly equivalent fleet. Unsurprisingly, you have a fairly interesting battle take place. Sorry, pressed the wrong button. Uh, there was a calm breeze from the northeast and a calm sea, not just a light breeze. Uh, Zuham, uh, Zitman maneuvered his line onto a port tack and headed southeast by east, awaiting Parker, who held the weather gauge. This is kind of unusual. You ha Zuman has the stronger fleet. Zuman should be trying to dictate this battle. The British fleet uh, were quite ragged in their initial approach due to the poor condition of some ships. And actually moved into a line of battle abreast in a, a, a originally. Uh, two ships were told to change places, which led to Dolphin, HMS Dolphin, um, actually ending up fighting against one of the largest ships and HMS Beneficent, actually not having an opponent. When Parker raises a battle flag shortly at 100 hours um, for a close action, the British fleet moved closer. Still, the Dutch ships didn't fire. As the British fleet actually got to within about half a musket shot apart. It's only then that Zoutman raised his flag and opened fire, raking fortitude with a broadside. The close action ensued, lasting three hours and 40 minutes. Around mid-morning, the Dutch merchantmen had moved away from the action and headed back to Texiel. And at 11.35 hours, Parker tried to reform his line as the ships had become unmanageable. At this point, his fleet drops to leeward, and while they're manoeuvring to reform boat of the line, both um, fleets disengage from fighting and sail for home. Here's the interesting thing on stats. Casualties on both sides are very high. Fewer casualties were suffered, for example, at the Battle of Chesapeake, for a month later between the fleets more than twice as large than at this one. Largely because neither, command, neither set of officers or sailors were prepared to give way. They're both very, very well trained, very well drilled forces, and they were very, very equal and were fighting away. British losses are reported at 104 killed and 339 wounded. Dutch report their losses 142 killed and 403 wounded. Um, but several historians have noted that there are unconfirmed reports suggesting Dutch casualties were a lot higher, possibly reaching 1,100 killed and wounded, than the figures originally, uh, that the figures, well documented figures, actually suggest. We're not sure about this one. I tend to side with the documentation, but. I also note that those ships, the Dutch vessels, do tend to have a bit of an overmanning going on, so they could well have lost people. And Holland sinks slowly due to damage sustained after the battle and the collision. Bell Pool, HMS Bell Pool, came upon her, and her colours, were, uh, which were still flying, these were captured and given to Parker as a spoil of war. So the British frigates were actually following up to try and track down the Dutch ships so the Royal Navy could re engage. Now, sorry, this is the one trouble of having on the computer. When I move the computer, because I'm trying to read things, it goes a bit funny. The uh, you now get to the reason why I like Parker so much. He tries to resign his commission. He gets back to Nor. King George is third, is waiting for him. And he says, I wish your majesty better ships and younger officers. As for myself, I'm now too old for the service. He is actually taught back in and agrees to serve again and gets killed on his way out. But he is one of the better there, the way he was going. 
but is one of the better officers the Royal Navy certainly has at the time. He is a good officer. The Zootman was a good officer. And it was a hard-fought battle. You have to consider if Eva had been against less capable officers in the other, they could both have had a chance of victory. The Dutch, the guns and British guns are fairly even, so if the Dutch had been against a officer of less fortitude, who'd been less able to hold his force together and reorganize them, they could well have won. And in the British case, if Zoopman had... Well, Zoopman made some mistake, you can argue, in that he holds his fire for quite for too long. And he could have started engaging the British earlier, but he might not have trusted his long-range gunnery. He might have felt conditions were impractical and it would have been a waste of powder. There are lots of sensible reasons for why he did what he did. But the thing is, Parker... If he'd been facing a less capable Dutch commander with what was obviously a well-drilled, well-organized force, they have just come off a transatlantic voyage. They meet a force which is equal in size to them, and they don't just engage, they fight them solidly. And yes, it's a victory on point because Holland sinks outwards and the losses don't. But they fight them solidly, and it's a three hour for a three hours forty minute battle. That is not in any way an easy or quick thing to deal with, they do it. That's a good commander, for starters. That's good crews for secondary. That's good officers and good NCOs for three and four. And that's good ships. Yes, they're worn out. Yes, he wants better ships. But that's all good qualities. Which speaks to him. If you faced a less capable Dutch commander, it could be a great victory we would talk about. We were talking about, you know, time when the Royal Navy met a force equivalent of the Dutch, and fighting the Dutch is always a harder battle than fighting the French. And there is a reason for this, because of, as I've discussed in several other videos, the uh, French go through first, there's the reforms, uh, well, there's the decoration which stops Protestant, uh, strips their navy of Protestant officers. And they lose quite a large chunk of officers, and that's done by Louis XIV. Um, one Protestant officer remains because he's his best admiral, so he basically does says, This doesn't apply to him, it applies to everyone else, but not him. His sons, his, all his family are who have been trained up and groomed to follow him. All the officers who he's been promoted who have been uh, Protestants have all stripped out. But you keep the admiral. You're losing the institutional memory he's been trying to build into your force, but you keep the admiral. Then you have also all the various revolutions and the getting rid of senior officers and experienced officers. Getting, losing senior NCOs, losing experienced shipwrights and the people who run the logistics side and the infrastructure side of the Navy. All these things undermine the French Navy and its ability to perform. The Dutch don't have that problem. The Dutch do have their own little issues, but they managed it because of their their number of admiralty, the number of admiralties they have, the number of institutions. They managed to maintain an institutional knowledge which allows them to keep producing ships. Their only problem is they produce slightly weaker, lighter ships because of the getting in and out of the uh, Netherlands. And that's ultimately their problem. Anyway, as I did with part one, this is going to go back through all the all the slides, so anyone who wants to see them in full can see them. Right. I hope you enjoyed part two, and I hope you'll enjoy the remaining parts to come. Thank you, and take care.